Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thanks for joining us today. Um, uh, another in our IMG webinar series. Uh, my name is Fatima Tokoglu. I'm partner business manager at Microfocus um, and work very closely with uh, all our key partners. Um, and today we have uh, the wonderful Carl from Wildlinks joining us um, to do a fantastic Did You Know session, um, you know, helping you to understand a bit more about Content Manager. Um, you know, how it integrates with 365, the web draw, the new web client, um, and, and also the very many things that they offer around that, including, uh, including their training. Um, and if you don't know, Carl is a general manager at, at Wildlinks. Um, so just before I hand over to Carl, I'll just remind everybody that you can ask ask questions, so, so please do. And I know we've got a couple of polls, so please do be part of that as well. Um, and on that, I might just hand over to Carl now. Thanks again. Super, thanks Fatima. Um, yeah, as Fatima said, again, this session is really a bit about a, a did you know session, so focus solely on content manager. Um, we're gonna to talk today a little bit, We've got a pretty jam packed agenda, so I'm gonna try and get through most of it. Um, we actually arm wrestled internally all the things, there's about 50 items that we saw as sort of, I suppose the key things that we wanted to talk to. Um, I haven't got 50 and we didn't have the time, but this is just some of the things. So. A little bit about today, who I am, which is uh, sometimes important, maybe not if you ask me, but who we are as a team. Um, the micro, as Fatima said, all the different topics, the 365 integration, web drawer, web client, online training portal, search forms, custom search columns, uh, configuration options for some annoying things as admins as we always get, uh, data port, LDAP, uh, copy and paste, print merge, smart move and email link. Uh, as Fatima said, in the question box, uh, post questions, I'd like this to be interactive. This is all about you in that way. Um, so what I hope we actually get out today is literally this, sharing knowledge and, and understanding what is possible in Content Manager. Uh, for those that have seen uh, me do my little hand diagram, most people know this much, and it's all of this part that we're, I suppose we focus on. Um, so again, we're gonna work on that sort of other 60, 70%. Um, learn more than before you actually attended. That's obviously, again, good takeaway for this, and hopefully take some stuff back to your organization and implement it. In relation to what I need from you, um, engagement and polls. So again, there will be a couple of polls, again, voting on those different options, questions, questions, and more questions. As I said, this session is solely about you. Um, this is all about, you know, the more you engage, the more you'll get out of it. Um, and an open mind, probably the most important part. So um, this is a little quote that I've been, I suppose, talking about for the last sort of six months with a lot of different organizations, but um, technically an organization is only as good as their system admin and their willingness to learn and promote the system even if they don't like certain features. And I'll talk about that in a couple of slides about sort of what that means and, and how that can affect an organization. A little bit about me, fell into this space, uh, nowhere was gonna um, be there in any sense of the word, um, but, but obviously love where I uh, you know, sit in every day of the week. Uh, worked at Sunshine Coast Council, pretty much from anything from customer service all the way through to scanning mail, to running archives facilities. Um, SharePoint up implementations, upgrades, network drive migrations, tech one administrator, migrated to content manager, saw the light, so to speak, went out to market, um, you know, supported a, a system for two and a half thousand users. Um, we actually put content manager or records manager at the time in the cloud as the first in the world to do that, which was pretty cool. Um, and again, I suppose post all that, left government, uh, sorry, and then worked into to the Wildlinks team. In relation to systems, there's not many that I haven't used uh, over the course, but uh, again, just a little bit of background about you know, being on your side of the fence. A little bit about who we are as a company. So we're established, a uh, Queensland-based company established in 2009. Uh, we're a micro-focused partner. We don't just do content manager, so we look at that holistic approach, the, the unstructured and the structured. Um, we're also a Microsoft partner, DocuSign partner, obviously room for Broly and a couple other things as well. Um, this is an example of our, I suppose, tagline purpose for a business. We actually rechanged this recently, but um, we we came up with this by working with the team. And I suppose the, the reason for it is because every one of our team take your business personally. So that's, I suppose, our bit of approach, a little bit different. Uh, you're not a number. We actually generally care about everything that we do for our clients in that space. Uh, so poll time. Uh, if we can launch the first poll. And again, I will just go through this. So the first question, so did you know that Microfocus has a free, and I'll put the word around free, um, out of the box integration with Microsoft 365? So that could be Teams, SharePoint, OneDrive, whatever it may be within that space. 
a quick little vote on that as we collate. Cool. We can show those results. So more yes than no's, which is good. Um, again, if I, uh, I've done this presentation or done some part of this presentation a couple of years back, that answer was actually no. Um, people didn't know it existed. So something uh, in marketing, micro focus, something that we're talking about is definitely helping, uh, which is great. Um, so just a quick little high level overview of what the integration is and how it works. So to give you an example, it works on the context of um, uh, life cycle management or life cycle of the information. So again, uh, the concept is that it could live within SharePoint, Teams, OneDrive for a period, and then it starts getting managed within Content Manager. You could also manage it from the very start, common question that comes up, um, but at the end of the day, it's just up to you when you want to manage it. In relation to the out-of-the-box integration, there's four different options. So manage, finalize at the top part of that quadrant. That top part is really around when the information is still, and the, the electronic document is still in uh, SharePoint but there's a metadata record sitting within Content Manager. The bottom half of that horizon is when you actually relocate or archive that information, and that's when you actually move that document from SharePoint into Content Manager. And I say SharePoint Teams, they're, they're all much, much less in the same as that. In relation to what the integration can do, um, so much that it's probably quite confusing. Um, it's one of the things that comes up a lot when we work with clients, um, because over here on the right, you can actually manage literally anything within SharePoint. So it can be a list item, it can be document sets, it can be documents, folders, you can manage a whole site and I'll talk about that and show an example. There is a fair bit in relation to what you can do and a big rules engine about how you want to manage that. Quick little example of sort of what you could do. Now again this is just an example, use it for a bit of a demo. Um, talking about an intranet, this could be a team site, it really just depends on your um, I suppose architecture within the SharePoint or the Microsoft space. But you might have these types of examples that are pretty common. Um, you might have a legal sort of site working in SharePoint and you can actually automatically manage that content. So you can again change the rules for each one of these boxes uh, as you wish or you can have one sweeping rule to do all. Uh, you might have a team collaboration one and you go, well, like we're just talking about having coffee and, and whose birth that is. We don't want to manage that corporately. Um, you know, that's perfectly fine. You don't have to manage it. You could also then have things like projects and you could say that leave it in uh, SharePoint or in Teams for the life cycle of the project and once the project has ended, you then migrate that into Content Manager at that point. Again, different rules for different scenarios, you can't treat everything the same, so to speak. Uh, policies, this is a, I suppose 101 sort of where everyone starts with this integration where you might have policies sitting within Content Manager and you want to actually externally expose them into SharePoint or, or, or wherever that may be. So. You know, most people, if you've got um, SharePoint, um, you'll have copies of documents sitting there, a manual process to update it. You might have TR5s, you might have links to your web client. Again, this is a way to say that CM is the governing source. You expose those documents to, um, to SharePoint and the rest is, is history after that. You do an update in Content Manager and it pushes it back up into, uh, into the SharePoint space as well. You also have the ability to federate your search. So again, I'll talk about that shortly, but you can search within SharePoint and bring up stuff in Content Manager. Again, it's an option if you want to deploy it. And again, every single one of these options is the same here on the right-hand side as well. So whether it's Office Online, or whether it's 365, SharePoint or OneDrive, they're all very similar in that approach. A um, Couple of quick little videos. So this is an example of exposing records. So again, using that policies and procedures example, pretty straightforward, but there's an ability here to say that I want to look in a folder and this folder is a, is a HR folder in this example. It's got a number of documents within it. And what I'm going to do is actually then configure that in the SharePoint integration and take those documents into to SharePoint. So this is just an example of just going through and doing this one-on-one -on -one basic example. Most people start here. This is kind of the graduation step when you do the integration. Uh, and then you progress into the more complicated things after that. I uh, just saw a quick question come up. Uh, thanks, Mark. Um, so yeah, do you need CM10 or CM9? Is that okay? This integration has been around for, geez, before I started, but 8.2 days is when I started with Content Manager. So yeah, any of these current, um, up until the latest release, this is, is still there today. Obviously, getting to the, the more you progress, but definitely um, is available in, in, in version nine as well. There are a couple of things that I'll talk about in 10, but I'll, um, I'll call them out specifically, or 10.1, sorry. 
Um, so in this example, again, I'm just doing a really basic string search. So for the CM people in the room, you can make this as complicated or as simple as you want. This is a very, just show me everything in a folder example. You can have, show me the policy record type that has a tick box that says, make it, um, I put it on the intranet. Um, and it has to be the latest revision. Whatever string search you can come up with in Content Manager, you can do the same uh, within here. As you then save that off, uh, as we go through the mission, um, what actually happened to kicks off job behind this, when we go through and have a look, what actually happens is documents start getting copied from Content Manager into SharePoint see through. You can also show other metadata, you don't have to. Some people want to say, see the record number, or maybe a, you might have fields like policy owners or the sincere area that you want to sort of show. The more you show and share, the more you can then point to have different views and, and, and things like that. But again, it is an option for you to do that. You don't have to do it. But to give you an example, again, that will just keep exposing those documents. And as you add more into that container or more meet that search rule, that string search, uh, again, they'll automatically expose behind the scenes for you. So no having to update that manually. This is just a quick little example of managing a document. <clears throat> so we did exposure, that's the starting point. Now we're gonna manage some content. This is the second point. This is where it gets a bit more fun for me, I think. Um, so those four quadrants we talked about at the very start, the manage, the finalize, the relocate, and the archive. So in this example, we relocate, manage the document. So the metadata record sitting in Content Manager. I'm actually going to move that electronic document from SHIP and put it into Content Manager. Now, as you'll see on the screen there, lots of different rules, the record types, the business mapping, the, the retention schedule, all those things you configure as part of that approach. Again, where you move that in Content Manager really comes down to your strategy. Um, you know, what retention rules apply, where you put it in the files uh, plan or the BCS. And again, they're all choices you just need to make. As we sort of go through that, we can do a search, and if we just pause that video there, uh, we can see that they, that document currently is a metadata record. So again, it's aware of that document living in content uh, in SharePoint, but the actual document is still in SharePoint. Because we hit relocate, that document, as it just happened really quickly just then, uh, has now moved back into, or moved from SharePoint into Content Manager. So again, this is just a way that when, to, to move a file, uh, and you go back to SharePoint and that, that file is now moved. You could do that function on one, a, a whole you know, a whole list of them. You could tag 10 files, you could tag a whole library if you wanted to, or a whole folder. It doesn't really matter, it's just the concept of showing how to manage something manually. Archiving a site, this is a good one for the IT teams in the room, uh, if we do have anybody, but um, I always have these discussions with IT about how you manage your information, and normally there's an archive in SharePoint, and that's as far as we get, where managing it in SharePoint. Um, but those same sort of functions, those four functions you can do for a whole site or the site level. So in this example, I've already managed the site. So I've got metadata records sitting in Content Manager. So again, audit trails, I'm aware of things happening. What I now wanna do is actually archive the whole site. Now again, go back to that very first picture that had the all the different objects around it. That's lists, libraries, documents, document sets, the works, again, Every single object within the SharePoint space can be managed. This is just an example of managing the whole site. So what that does is, again, some of these are still metadata because, again, they're just uh, hierarchical in how they sit. But if I pause it there, that site and every other bits of the contents is now in Content Manager. So if I go back to that original example, all of this that used to have folders and lists and libraries, you go to the end, is now a blank shell. So we've actually just taken that whole site, moved it in, and now IT could actually delete this site and we are now managing it properly um, and bring it into Content Manager. Um, so that was a very basic manual and uh, manual management. And again, when I go through this demo, normally it normally takes about an hour, a lot more intense and a lot more deeper. But in this example, you've also got the ability to create rules. So the rule is the, what do you wanna manage? When do you wanna manage it? And how do you wanna manage it? So again, in this example, this is actually a customer and we did, you might want to your choice, um, have an option in SharePoint that says um, move to CM. So if you're not familiar with SharePoint, very similar to Content Manager, you can create content types. They're very similar to record types, literally the same sort of thing, defining metadata, what you wanna capture. And again, the rule that I've set up on this side is when someone clicks that button, move to CM, that's the trigger to move that file into Content Manager. So you can involve the business if you wanted to, 
and again have this rule across many sites, just a site, and say again, when Carl clicks the button move to CM, what's actually going to happen? And it equals yes, is it's going to move the document behind the scenes and put it in Content Manager. So to give you an example, now it's getting updated from the SharePoint app. <clears throat> when I refresh that site, go and have a look. That document, Performance Appraisal, was the document that I said to move to Content Manager before, has now moved into Content Manager. So again, you can have those options. It's not right or wrong. There's no pros or cons about that. It just comes down to what your business requirements are about that one. And again, all those can be applied to a library level. You can have multiple rules or multiple uh, automations, so to speak, um, on that within the integration. It just comes down to making sure you don't have conflicting rules. Okay, one saying move, one saying keep. <laughs> uh, that will be a bit of a problem for you. Um, the other option, so this is probably one of the more preferred options um, where you let the business work. And I think this has kind of changed a fair bit recently, but let the business work in that SharePoint Teams or, or OneDrive space uh, and manage that stuff automatically behind the scenes for them. So I've put in a document here before, the uh, uh, review document, sorry, renewal document. Um, I've applied a policy, so an automation to this library. It says as soon as something's created, automatically create a metadata record or manage it in the, in the terminology of the integration. And what actually happens is when I go into Content Manager, that is actually already sitting there as a metadata record because I've applied that. Now again, that's just creating metadata records. So again, I'm, I'm now aware of that in Content Manager. I'm managing it in place, so to speak. Um, again, I could have another rule that says in three years time or in six months, or if it hasn't been edited in two months, move the file into Content Manager. So again, the world is your oyster. I haven't found a question or a business requirement yet we haven't met. Um, there's been some fun ones, but again, it comes down to sort of what you want to want to do in that space. The other fun thing, so um, as, a, as an IM person, uh, again, I've seen it many a times with IT that if you delete something in the SharePoint space or the Microsoft space, it actually deletes the file completely out of your tenant. There are configuration options in the Microsoft space to stop that. Again, first stage, second stage recycle bins and then holds on the end of that. However, if the integration is in place and a user has the ability to delete, then they do delete a document. And again, if I'm managing this space already by default, the actual document uh, as a safety net actually moves that back into Content Manager. So again, I deleted that document just then. And again, as a user, someone's hit delete, but because I was managing it, it's automatically put that into Content Manager for me. So again, a bit of a safety net to sort of how that works. Um, so Mark, to answer your question, so this is definitely 10.1. Um, so again, in 10.1, only came out three weeks ago, um, you now have a native Teams integration app. So very different. There's a client side one that you can add to the ribbon. You can then manage those files in either manually or, uh, or manually for the client side one. You can also add that to posts. Um, oh, sorry, in, in chats, and you can manage chat threads as well. Again, you know, the chat thread, the attachments in a chat thread. And you also have a server side option for this to manage it automatically behind the scenes without the users having to be aware. So you've really got, again, more options to, to manage that content that's not sitting in, in CM by default. Um, just a couple of real quick use cases. So there's, there's definitely people out here using this integration. Uh, again, I think one of the big stigmas around it was people didn't know what it did, thus they didn't start to do it. I did see Kylie from McTish on the call as well. I know she's implemented a number of times as well, as have we. Um, but again, that ability to actually start to manage this content. So City Parklands is a good example. Um, again, new internet project, trying to redesign their internet. So Heather and the team there were redesigning that, but also then wanting to manage that content and make it easier. Um, they used to use, um, I suppose, a board paper application, um, taking them out of CM. They now just use SharePoint. They expose those documents to a, uh, to a site specifically for the board function. Uh, and then remove them as they need to. So again, saving costs on that perspective. The other thing is the users, unfortunately, like everyone does, is you know when a policy is approved, they've got to take a copy, they send it to the comms team, the comms team put it online. It takes time, it's never up to date, it's just a, a human process, reduced all of that as well. And these guys are actually doing a couple of innovative things. They're sharing files externally with some other entities via SharePoint. So kind of think of it as, a, as an extranet. You take some documents from CM, you again by a search, you push that to a site called, you know, I'll, again, uh, lawyer firm A, 
uh, you share all those files there and you're not having to send copies of it. Again, they're, they were still within your network and someone can actually externally see that if you wish to. Um, these guys are also looking at it, Ben, again, adding the dots together. So, you know, having a form that they fill in in, in the Microsoft space, updates a SharePoint list, that list then automatically gets managed into Content Manager for any sort of the inspections that they do around um, the Brisbane Gardens and, and areas that they maintain. Uh, there's another one for Catholic Ed. So there's two for these guys, but they actually scan um, student files into SharePoint. Uh, again, just because they don't have access to everyone having CM. Um, but behind the scenes, those student files are getting captured and automatically managed for the life cycle of that document. So again, using EasyScan to get into SharePoint, SharePoint being managed directly into Content Manager, and again, being managed for that period of time. This example is probably one of my favorites, but um, again, this, most organizations have this, that goes back to that exposure example I talked about. But this was an example of all these little tick boxes used to be a site. So when a policy um, got changed or, or a um, policy procedure, anything to do with the schools, they had to update these documents across multiple different school sites. So this head office looks after 40 schools. That means they had to manually go and put those documents on 40 different SharePoint sites. Uh, we don't do that anymore. Um, Nicole and the team literally click the buttons and each one of those SharePoint sites is configured to say, if it says administration WHS and it has a tick box to go to the intranet, it automatically goes to the right spots. So Nicole and the team manage it in CM, which they always have, now just tick some options and the integration goes and moves those documents to the 40 or 10 or 20 or whatever the number may, may need to be to those sites for them. And again, saves that whole manual effort uh, as part of that process. Um, so another poll question, we can launch that. So this one's around WebDrawer. So again, WebDrawer has been the product for a while, um, but we're just gonna see what everyone knows uh, about the product. So the question is, what is WebDrawer? Is it an interface to create records, an interface to search, or you're not sure and you haven't heard of it, which is perfectly fine. Cool, if we can just show those results in a sec. It's interesting to see it change around between everybody. So we've got a 50% split for an interface to search. So those 50% of people, you are correct. Um, an interface to create records, unfortunately not. We'll talk about that and not sure. Again, perfect. That's exactly what we're here for and that's exactly what we're, we're talking about. So WebDrawer, one of the most uh, underutilized products in my opinion, been around since, um, well, since Noah was a lad. Um, again, there's a cut down version of the web client, only allows you to search. You can't create records, it's only a search interface. However, what you can do with it is I suppose, a little bit different if you think outside the box. Um, so it could just be an internal uh, site that you search for student records or policies and procedures or an external site looking for uh, public information. You might use it to publish information internally. So again, to your intranet or to another application. So a CRM system or a finance system or those types of things. And you can also publish that information externally as well, which we'll talk about in a sec. So a little pretty picture of sort of what happens or what could happen. You do something in Content Manager, WebDrawer then again allows you to, to search for that document or generate a URL or, or be able to search for those files. And again, an internal person could look at it or an external person could potentially look at it. So what's it look like out of the box? Um, not amazingly pretty, but this is what it looks like by default. You've got searches, you've got some trays, some quick searches, and you have some search forms, which we'll talk about later. This is what it looks like out of the box. Again, it's very hierarchical. You keep clicking, you can then get to the next level, shows you more about content manager metadata. And again, you've got some options to, I suppose, do something, preview the document, download it, you know, those types of things. This is an example um, that we set up as part of Sunshine Coast Council, but this is an example that we've replicated multiple times. So this is an external system. This is to do with all of their um, development applications. So it's a publicly facing website that they have on the internet. When they click this option, it does a search directly into Content Manager to find information that matches it. So we're doing a public search, so again, using the security level of being public. And again, there's a fair bit of security and other things in this space. But the whole idea is if I go back to this, it's dynamically passing that number into Content Manager on the fly. So again, if a document meets the criteria today, but doesn't meet it in six minutes time, it won't show it. We're doing a search and we've found, again, documents that have that number. So we're searching additional field 
for public information. So again, you know, from what they used to have, where they had to manually upload, the, upload these to a website, and then if there was problems, had to pull them down. Again, it was quite, um, I suppose, person orientated and a lot of um, hand holding. This is directly into CM, directly, again, security, for those that are keen on that. Um, security is, is quite critical for this process, but again, that ability that anyone can look at any public documentation directly from that. So again, just a way of joining those sort of two dots together. This is, again, there's things on the market that you know, cost a lot of money to do exactly this, but you already have an example that you can use directly out of, um, out of Content Manager out of the box that you're already paying for. We'll talk about some search forms and how that could sort of be extended a little bit later, but again, you could have the ability to have a student search form. I know there's someone on the call that's looking at that at the moment. You could have, a, a, again, a search form, and we'll talk more about what that means in a second, but that could also be about policies and procedures that you're searching for. Again, any different record type or business function could also be used in the exact same way. Um, so the web client, um, what does it look like out of the box? Um, again, it keeps changing, uh, which is great as it gets more and more um, from micro focus and the development and feedback. Looks a little bit like this. Again, you can navigate down to records. You've got an action pane and a property pane on the right hand side. Uh, it's got a, you could literally do a full search just like you can within Content Manager. Most people don't know this exists, but again, if you really wanted to do a complicated search in Content Manager, you can do the same in the web client. Um, in 10.1, um, you also have the ability to have a grid view. So this came in, again, this looks probably similar to the um, thick client. So again, a move from a lot of organizations trying to go to the web client. You can actually have these different columns and change those columns as you wish. So again, if I look like this, you know, going back to these views, you can't do that in the earlier versions. In 10.1 and onwards, or 10 and 10.1 onwards, you can now change that view between a grid view or a list view in that example. So what's the, or who's the web client for? It's actually for everyone in my opinion. Um, every organization should learn about it uh, and you should offer it to your users by default. Um, so this is a quick little example we did. We did a gap analysis in 9.2 with quite a large Queensland government entity with uh, I'll say upwards of 5,000 users. Um, they were looking to switch cold turkey across to the web client. There were three things that were the deal breakers for them and this was in 9.2. The ability to drag and drop multiple documents, uh, complicated searches, and also bulk editing multiple um, properties. All of those have been released in since 9.4. So again, I suppose the feedback that you give to Microfocus, I said this at a user group recently, helps the product. And this is an example that that could now be fit for purpose for that organization. Um, the issues with the web client, um, this one might be a little bit home hitting, but um, system admins not knowing what that does. So um, again, in past lives, I had to actually get my team to go and use it because again, as a system admin, we naturally gravitate towards the thick client. It's our little comfort space, um, but actually wanted people to actually understand it. Um, they don't know how to support it is the other problem. And then this one is the, um, the system admins not offering it to their users because they don't like it. So I had this example with a client recently, we were talking about not liking it. So that one user, go back to that very first, uh, well, first couple of slides, that one user not liking or not knowing what CM does or can do affects 8,000 people. So again, if they don't offer it because they don't like it or they don't wanna use it, that's fine. But you need to be open to be able to understand it because there might be a use case and I'll put, money on the table, a mortgage or a child, um, that there are examples for that in that organization. They're just not willing to admit it or wanting to show it. So again, to go back to that sort of diagram, you need to learn the full aspect of the system because this gets, uh, the web client gets a lot of flack when it probably doesn't need to because admins, myself included, don't, you know, may not like to, to go out of our comfort zone in that space. The other fundamental thing is, and I've seen this more times than I can count, an organization goes, cool, we're doing an upgrade, we're going from the desktop client and we're gonna click our fingers and tomorrow we're gonna to be the web client. It's normally a very IT driven approach. Um, again, if you go cold turkey from something from 10 years, you need to put in training, you need to put in effort. Um, again, helping those people, manuals, guides, whatever it needs to be to get them uh, moving on that way. Um, the training portal. So this is something we actually came up with, um, again, if I sit on the other side of the fence, um, you know, back every time that you do an upgrade, you've got much training material, you've got to recreate it every version, things change, buttons change, it becomes, you know, quite a bit of a fun challenge. Um, so what we actually end up doing, we did this, we started this uh, back in nine point, sorry, 8.2 days. 
But uh, we created a, a product and a tool that allows organizations to have this content, but not have to create it, maintain it, or worry about it. So again, we'll go through this uh, shortly. We actually brand it so it's your theme, not ours. We just maintain the content for a fee. Uh, it also means that, again, it, as versions happen, the next version is already there. So our team is already creating 10.1 content, and we don't have any clients on 10.1 today. In a month or two, we probably will, so that content will be there for them when they need it. And again, it's something that if anyone goes through any of our training um, options, be it a, an e-learn training option or a individual training session we do, or a group training session, you also get access to this for 12 months. Um, but to give you an example, the cost of this per user per month for a, and again, this is tiered, the more you have, the, the cheaper it gets, is $2 a month. Now, less than a, coffee, a cup of coffee, but again, that ability to, to go through it uh, and have all this content. There's more content than you'll ever need. Um, again, some examples of some branding ones for Central Queensland Uni or Queensland Health. The other thing that we do, and this is, uh, again, I'll go back to my internal days as an admin, uh, you often do training or you often have content, but you may not measure if it's actually effective. And that's a bit of a problem because you're putting all this effort in, but not showing if people look at it. Uh, happens time and time again. So what we do behind the scenes is every user who goes into the system, um, we track what they do. So they click something, they search for something, whatever they need to do, and then we provide that back to you as an admin. So in, in this example, you can see this, this client, 370 guides that they've looked at, uh, create a record guide has had the most impact. And again, breaking all these statistics down, you can then provide targeted training. So if my user base, as an example, keeps looking at searching content, as an admin, I could make a correlation that says, you should probably do some searching training because everyone's looking to it or gravitating towards it versus me just doing end user training and not really thinking about you know the impacts of that. So a quick little example of this content behind the scenes, like I said, there's so much versions from even stuff for control point or file analysis suite sitting in, it's kind of our mecca. Um, quick guides, tech notes, you name it, stuff for admins, uh, stuff for end users, the different functions, the different objects and the ability to search. So again, this is in our brand. So again, if you go through a training course, you'll get our brand. If you start putting this toward end users, I'll encourage you to brand it yourself, as in we put your brand on it. Um, but again, that ability to actually see all these guides, videos, uh, and that example is quite handy. I use the videos as kind of like a little um, YouTube. Um, I recently had a plumber here this morning, actually, trying to be a plumber myself. Didn't turn out well, uh, called the expert. So again, this is that sort of one-stop shop that allows me to, to search. Uh, and then come to you after the fact. The other thing too that goes with it is for some of our clients that have you know 3,000 odd users in the platform, they have less support overhead if they encourage users to come here and then incorporate it into their processes because they'll self-help or uh, teach them to fish, so to speak. Uh, and again, within that, it reduces the support overhead. So you then start to do more value add services as part of that. Um, search forms. So again, one of my favorite things, anyone on my team doesn't know what a search form is, that's a big problem. Uh, it is one of the favorite features that I've had in the system for a long time, it's been there for a while. Later versions, it's now in the full client, um, but really what it is, is, is again, think of it as business specific or record type specific forms to make searching easier for users. So to give you an example, um, this is one that I've got here. Uh, from 10.0 onwards, it came into the uh, big client, which is perfect. So right there, and I'll pause it there. This is an example of a form. So again, this form is the same on the web client, which you'll see in a second, but these are custom fields specifically specific to a business function. That business function, then again, you could have many of these forms, restrict these forms for different users. What this means is I can do a search right now for an additional field called Eric Anderson. I don't have to learn how to search. I don't have to be a search wizard as an end user. As an admin, I can just make that easier for an, for an end user to search. Same in the web client, they've been in the web client since oh, 8.2, I was aware of 8.1. Uh, again, those same additional fields, you can do the search, find the information and do that from there. So again, very simple to use, uh, highly recommend having a look at it, especially if you're on .0 onwards, a thick client, but even if you're in the web client, experiment with it. Those same search forms come up in web drawer. So again, loop back to the web drawer scenario, you can have a search form for student records, you can have a search form for um, policies and procedures, all those things are possible to make searching easier for a user. And again, if I go back to this example, if I wanted to do an employee name search and an ID search, teaching a user how to do a Boolean search, or again, multi-field, uh, multi depending on how you've got it set up, 
you know, is quite hard for a user, but for a user to type Carl Duncan employee number one, two, three, four, and click go is much easier for them. So again, these little things help uh, on a big yield for the, for the end users. This is the other end of search forms. So if you haven't seen it, you can go to the manage tab and uh, double click on a search form or create one. So right click new, you give it a name. You can search for different objects as well. It's not just record centric. It could be locations, uh, retention to schedules, you name it, there's lots of choices. And you can then go and create these um, options. Uh, so by default, there's four different sort of high level tabs. Um, but again, you can find any field down here in the bottom, click the insert button and it will move up onto your search form. So again, you can tweak that, change, move the layout, do what you need to do. And you can also go through and actually restrict this. So again, the security model that's within Content Manager is still the same. If Carl can't see it, Carl can't do anything for it. Custom search results. This is um, what I think, well, what I would have thought was a bit of a simple scenario, but however, um, it's surprisingly how many people that we've, we've crossed the path, admins inclusive, uh, of that statement that don't know that this is a thing. So again, this is what the whole session is, you know, did you know? Um, but again, allows you to have uh, predefined columns, make it easy for searching, reporting, whatever it needs to be. So in this example, I've got a search. Um, when I double click the search, you'll see I've got four columns currently. Now these four columns will be out of the box, whatever you've set as globals. If I go back in and actually edit these properties uh, and I edit the query, I go to the results tab and I can actually change these search results for this search. So again, I'm doing, I suppose, centered around employees today. Uh, but that ability to say here, let's not use the default search options because again, I wanna control the outcome or control the results. I can go and find those fields, employee ID, employee name, you know, whatever else I wanna do, end dates, you name it, click OK. And when I actually do this, it's going to, now when I run that search, it's actually gonna not do the defaults and give me the fields that I've asked it to give me. So as an option here, when I just change the columns, I can see all of the metadata that I've asked it to do. Again, such a small thing, surprising again, uh, how many people have, have learned that as part of a scenario. Uh, registry changes. So this might look like black magic to a couple of people uh, or developer land or highly technical. Um, however, there's a couple of examples that make life easier. So admins dropping out, um, if I had hand voting and all the fun, it was teams, I'd be a lot more interactive here, but I'm pretty sure um, this, I haven't found a site that hasn't had this problem at some point in time. The reason why your Microsoft admins drop out is Microsoft made a change a couple of years back and it keeps changing all the time, that if any external add-in didn't load within a period, um, it actually drops it out. So it's not just CM's thing, it's just everyone's. However, um, you can actually set this and set a load behavior with this so it always waits for Content Manager to be loaded. Now, I'm not sure how much time goes through of, hey, Carl, you've got to go here, go to the files option, go to disabled add-ins and Outlook and then re-add the add-in. Um, the support for that is quite heavy. Um, I actually, we, we showed this to a new client in WA recently. They had been dealing with this issue for 10 years and no one gave them any advice, which is just boggles me because it's, it's some, such a quick fix that IT can roll out. But she, as soon as we gave her the example, gave her the key, she was like, that has literally just solved, you know, a third of my tickets because that's the, the painful thing that keeps coming up. And with that comes the, oh, content manager doesn't work. It's crap, it's shit, yada, 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 that comes with that scenario. Opening a mail attachment. So if you've ever done this and you send someone a TR5, you double click the, uh, the TR5 and you get this whole warning pop up again, it's there. Some people might not even read it. They might just click okay and go, cool. Um, but this again, this example allows you to, you can actually set this so it doesn't pop up for TR5 files. So again, it's one less click for a user, one less thing that content manager is showing in your face, um, which becomes, a, again, another big plus in that example. Offline records or working folders is actually helping someone this morning, a, a colleague and a friend about um, an issue she was having on a, on a client site. If you go to your file menu and go down to setup info, your working folders. So if you ever needed to know how CM sort of, I suppose, hung together, there's a number of working folders. Again, all of these are changeable via registry setting. So if you wanted to redirect your offline files, if you wanted to help with IT about knowing, um, and I'll use the example from this morning because it's fresh, um, there was an issue with an Outlook add-in, knowing where to find the preferences file, again, all of these things can be your friend. You can actually see this here and actually know where all those user settings are stored and then be able to work with IT or vendors to, to be able to help with that. 
uh, data port. Um, handy tool, again, I go back to the example, people know, may not know it sort of exists or how it works, but it can be used in a, in a very good way. Importing, exporting, updating data, changing records, creating new records, importing BCS or schedules, again, for just some of the common examples that we come across. Data port like, it looks like this, uh, pretty little example, but it's a bolt-on or, or I suppose there with Content Manager to do those bulk sort of functions. Um, as an example, we've just helped a client mog in um, all their files from uh, another entity using data port. It was a straightforward sort of migration and we taught them how to fish uh, in the sense that uh, we taught them data port and then we, taught, we helped them through their process. Now that user's doing mogs in and out using data port. Uh, if it's a little bit more complicated and requires code level sort of stuff, we help them out in that space, but really, again, uh, a handy little tool to do any sort of importing out, um, and exporting. This uh, little example for PTO, um, they had um, multiple different offices across the space uh, or across the, I suppose, Queensland region. Um, they were consolidating offices, they were sending all their physical records to offsite storage and they had all of where the physical files were on spreadsheets. They're not uncommon for a lot of our clients to do that, um, but they were looking at manually creating those into Content Manager. And there was a half a million plus files, um, which just would have taken a nightmare to do. So long story short, we actually went through a training session. So we, we do data port specific training because again, it's a super handy little tool. Um, so they went through that with us. Uh, we taught them how to fish. Um, so we then supported them uh, through a support package after that factor. But they ended up migrating. They ended up migrating. We just held their hand and, and taught them how to do it and supported them. Half a million files into Content Manager from spreadsheets. Now again, those spreadsheets needed a little bit of changing to get data port ready. But as we sort of um, showed them, they updated all those physical files in, in a matter of weeks and, and, and periods of time, rather than sitting there manually creating half a million files. So now CM, that spreadsheets are gone, they don't need them anymore. CM becomes that source of truth to, to, truth to know where the physical file is, if it's grace or wherever it may be. So again, handy little tool if you wanna have a look at that. LDAP integration uh, or AD integration, but I'll call it LDAP for this example. Um, so long story short, a little bit about what LDAP is. It's just a way that your Active Directory can talk to your content manager. And this is just a protocol without getting too complicated. Um, what does it mean for us admins um, is you can set this up and you can integrate your Active Directory with your uh, content manager users. Um, so what that means is you might have an example that when you create a new user, Carl comes to work for your organization today, um, IT give me an account and it automatically creates an account in Content Manager for me. Now again, you can get very creative with this or you can get very basic. So we've rolled this out for a client recently. Um, the example was we just want to do onboarding and offboarding. So we created users and then the admin team had to then go and actually you know, put them in the right groups, give them the right security levels and go through those motions. And then they also automated the offboarding. So Carl's left the organization today. Uh, again, access within Content Manager was terminated that exact same minute that the AD account was terminated. Now you can get quite complicated. Uh, and again, this was where you, I suppose, work with IT and blend Active Directory, which isn't as clean as Content Manager in my experience, to, uh, to Content Manager. But you can get to the example of actually creating organizational structures, creating users, positions, security groups, uh, again, really the world is your oyster and what you could do, but I'd stress start small and then build upon that. Um, and I suppose one of the benefits of this is actually, uh, and for this client, for the one we did before, was you know they had a lot of ghost locations because of, again, how their setup was. Um, we automated the ongoing management of user details. So you think of how long it takes to create a user. I'll say it's a, you know, roughly a minute. You know, you put the name, the first name, the last name, the email address, all the things that go with it. All of that went out the door. They, it just happens magically now. The big change with a lot of machinery at government, users coming on in droves and, and big batches. Again, as an admin sitting there clicking, go, 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 adding Carl. Uh, quite painful. Um, the ongoing compliance, again, is a big thing here, reducing that data entry stuff for the support team. So again, working with this, it's out of the box. It's already sitting there and you can do it directly today within Content Manager. Copy and paste, handy little feature. Again, um, again, you don't know, you don't know, right? But um, this is something that comes up, and people are quite wowed by it. But you can do a bulk copy in Content Manager of whatever search you've got. Open up Excel and paste these files directly into Excel. Now, again, some people in the room go, "Yep, cool, I get that." Been there, know that already. There'll be people in the room today that don't know that that's a thing. 
So again, just a very simple way of extracting data from a copy and a paste into Excel. Print merge, this is where you graduate a little bit more. Um, where you can, again, a print merge, another way to extract information from a system. You can right-click send to print merge. This is where you can then be a little bit more specific about the files or the types, sorry, the, the fields and the types of fields that you want to extract. You can extract it into a tab delimited file or a, a Word document. In this example, I'm doing to a, to a tab delimited. And then I'm opening this up within Excel. So again, same sort of process. I can get some files out. I can do a little bit more creative stuff in this example, um, but in the, again, different to the copy and paste example as well. So. Within 10.1, if anyone was at the user group recently in, in Queensland, um, you've also got now ability to have pre-configured print merge templates because sometimes in the past, it's been fun to explain to users, you've got a, you know, in this search bar is only new in 10, but go into the record properties, find that, find this, go lower, it gets quite wieldy as you go in there. Um, but again, that ability to, to search and also have templates now is a, is a big game changer. Uh, Smart move. So this is a little tool that we created uh, to help with a couple of use cases, but the use case, and this has been around for five years, actually was a client, I came up with the idea, or oh, sorry, not the idea, the pain point of when I drag and drop files, um, I've got the profile setting turned on and it keeps popping up this profile setting all the time, asking me to click yes, and my content manager's frozen. And the other issue is that when I drag and drop it, because I've got the profile setting turned on, it, it comes up called template one, not Carl's great document really named well, you know, dot doc. Um, so we had a bit of a look at this. Um, this and again, this tool has been added and changed for a lot of, uh, and there's a lot of governances in Queensland that have this tool and done some pretty cool things for it. But long story short, it's a standalone tool um, installed either per user or, or again per site, depending on how you want to configure it. Um, but again, it allows you to migrate files from a network drive, Outlook, OneDrive, Team, SharePoint, or, and when I say uh, computer, um, any map drive. So it could be OneDrive, network drives, Google drives, you name it, wherever it's a local drive can come through. Some fun little config options here as well. So again, the ability to delete files after import, pretty handy. I'm a big fan of one source of truth. Um, the other one that I really like is this create reference. So um, this tool has been used to clean up a lot of network drives, um, predominantly or SharePoint, old SharePoint sites that are managed by IT. Um, but that ability to say, move all these files into Content Manager, but leave a TR5 so that when Carl, the senior manager, comes back and goes, hey team, where did you move my files to? I can just double click a file and it will take me to that file. So again, that ability, that change management stuff is really important. Uh, again, from a licensing perspective, one user or many, again, cheaper as you get bigger, but from our perspective, uh, a per month fee of $100 or, or over an annual fee of 1200 and again, cheaper the more you buy. So just some of the things that are, these are all mostly Queensland departments, uh, wonderful piece of kit um, or a magical piece of kit. Um, this example of not being able to do their job without it um, is again, quite, these are comments directly from our user base using the tool. This one is handy, um, saved me three months of my year. So this person was actually uh, quite a large person who migrated from project teams as, as active projects to content manager and they migrated 250,000 files with that tool. Um, Another one um, that was on a previous laptop, it got replaced and SmartMove wasn't on it and the user had a meltdown, always a good example. Um, but again, uh, one of our clients, to give you an example, uh, has moved over 100 million files with SmartMove. Sorry, uh, a million files, not 100 million, that'd be super cool. But just one, 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 year, one client has used a million files. One user within that was doing, um, it was over six weeks and they managed to move nearly 300,000 files themselves, as well as do their regular job. Because again, there's no restriction when you're dragging and dropping this onto Content Manager, it doesn't freeze CM, they're working independently. So they were doing migrations over here on this screen, using CM and doing their regular job over here, and that ability to do it. This is just a quick little example. I've selected some files from a network drive. Um, I've added them on. I'm selecting a check-in style. So check-in styles, if you don't know what they are, you definitely need to learn more about them. CM 10.1 is gonna bring a lot more into check-in style spaces, um, but we've been using them for, again, for five years on how to template metadata. So again, the record type, additional fields, whatever you wanna set, you don't have to type those in every, you know, if you've got a batch of documents that are the same, you can just automate all those with a check-in style. Most people are probably gonna be used to check-in styles with Outlook, uh, but there's a lot more that you can do with them if you're a little bit creative. Um, you know, migrate those files, pretty straightforward. I go and actually have a look at that network drive in a second. 
and what actually comes up is I've migrated the files um, and I can double click on those files and bring them directly into Content Manager. So again, really quick example and a very simple one of, of that. Email link, last thing for this thing, and I've seen some questions, so I'll come back to those in a second. Um, so email link's been around for a while, not many people know about it. So again, this is what the session is, did you know? So check-in styles, hopefully most people are familiar with. Um, again, the difference being this is a client-side processing, email link is a server-side processing. So again, very similar, one-to-one -one relationships. I put it in a folder and then I go and put it somewhere in CM. Again, the ability to change that. The big difference is if you've got client-side um, check-in styles for either your mailbox or a shared mailbox, Outlook needs to be open for that to process and your add-in has to be working, obviously. Um, for the server-side options, you don't need Outlook open. I can move those files on my phone, as an example. Um, you can move those wherever you are. And again, it will happen, all the processing happens on the server. So it doesn't happen on the computer. And again, I suppose over the, over the history, things like um, shared mailbox has always been a fun thing with check-in styles, large volumes, or I create it and for teamers getting a pop-up or for teamer uses the check-in style and I get a pop-up saying, hey, what do you want to call the record? No, I'm not doing anything. Um, whereas this is on the server side, and this is just again a couple of sort of options. So to give you an example of what this looks like, I've got a folder here which is a client side check-in style. You can see that it again there's a queue process down the bottom that's happening, and I get a pop-up. Now again, I could have configured this not to come up if I'd met the criteria. This one though is the one that's again uh, enabled at the server side level. So I'm dragging, dropping things in. I could drop 100 in; it doesn't matter. And it, I've got no pop-up, it's all happening at that server side example. So on a check-in style, when you go through and have a look at this, you look at your defaults, again, heaps of fun stuff you can do in check-in styles, but this little screen here is the one where uh, you tick the box to automatically create that server side folder. Now again, check-in style, uh, sorry, email link needs to be set up with your IT team. Uh, there's again, there's a couple extra steps that need to be installed to make that happen. But it, again, it's a very handy little fun uh, option as part of that process. And you can see that if I go and have a look at that container, all those files are directly in there as well. So yeah, thank you for, I hopefully found it interesting. I've just had a couple of questions. I thought I was race through that. Um, and so, Gabby, um, so you've got a question here. It says, hi Carl, can the scenario be accommodated documents are in SharePoint sync to Content Manager using WebDrawer for public access? Uh, do, you, do you mind coming off mute, Gab? Or, um, Kirsten, if we can make Gabby just come off mute and we can expand on that a little bit? Hi, Carl. Um, yeah, so I guess I'm just in that in scenario where you showed us the document syncing to SharePoint and then in another section you showed us using WebDraw. So as you yeah. know, SharePoint online sites can't be public access. Yeah. I'm wondering if there is a way. So think of let's say a policy library. Um, the policy library is managed in SharePoint. Um, and then we've got a whole other convoluted process which publishes uh -huh. our um, public policy documents with search, et cetera. Uh -huh. Is there a way to get rid of that other convoluted process where you would sync them to uh, CM and then use WebDraw to expo expose whatever ones publicly? Yep, uh, in, in short, yeah, 100%. Yeah, so I'm actually we're going through this process with a client at the moment where we're doing this second scenario um, for policies and procedures, this exact example, um, mm -hmm. and it's going to go onto their external website, but it's also going to go onto an external application. So this is actually so that they can come in and do safety audits, know all the policies and procedures for what they're about to audit. Um, and so, yeah, that can actually expose directly from Content Manager. And then mm -hmm. to add to that, you could also still have your integration for the internal use case as well, putting it on SharePoint internally. So you can use both to do the same okay. sort of thing. So no, right. no awesome. reasons around that. Okay. Uh, you, you had another question there about getting around. Oh, that was just, yeah. Adding. So, yeah. No, Hit perfect. send before I finish my question. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no, no, thanks for the question. Uh, Mark, so you've got completely agree organisations that have rolled out their own devices and VPN versus the web client. Um, yeah. Couldn't agree more web client. Again, um, I actually was on a call earlier this morning. Um, not everyone, when they work from home, has the ability to access Content Manager. Um, again, it's more of an IT issue than a CM issue, but CM always gets blamed in my experience. Um, so again, yeah, the web client is a perfect example. Again, you could also work with IT to get around that with some VPNs or external exposing your CM, um, but definitely doable. 
Um, having a quick look there, Kim, you got a question. So if, if you share a saved search, will the column uh, settings be shared too? Spot on, 100%, yep. So if you point me to that saved search that I had as that example, when you click it or I click it, the result's gonna be the same. So I suppose that's the big thing about uh, making that easier for people. Um, that again, they don't have to have their columns set up how I have them, it will default to whatever you've set up as that saved search, which is again, handy little feature. Um, so Scott, you had a question. You can copy and paste record numbers from Excel back into CM via the tray and favorites or for easy updating. Great knowledge there, I love it. Um, so you're 100%, if you go to that example I had before, which is here, the copy and paste one. Uh, again, handy little feature that no one really knows about, but you can definitely, I've got to find the right slide, would help me, but you can definitely um, copy and paste uh, that one. Um, so if you have all those record numbers, you can paste them into a tray. So again, you can go back the way as well. So yeah, great, great session. Great question. Um, and I've just got one, a couple of thanks. So no, otherwise, again, hopefully, again, you've learnt a little bit, hopefully coming into today, a little bit more than you walked in with, hopefully. Uh, hopefully expanded some thought and giving you, again, some thought bubbles to think about over the next couple of days, weeks or months. Uh, and again, this is just a little bit of this uh, session. Uh, and again, there's more and more of these features that go with it. Um, so just one, a couple other questions rolling in. So um, this is probably one for the MicroFocus team, but uh, Elise has asked, will the recording? And um, yes, it will be. Guest process is part of the go to, um, a go to meeting function and you'll get a link within a couple of days. So I, I do realize we've gone through a lot of stuff very quickly. Head's probably going, oh my God, but web drawer and then this and then that. Hit pause, <laughs> ask questions, reach out. I'm always, always happy to help. Yes. Thanks, Carl. Um, no. That was great. Lots of obviously fantastic tips. Um, the questions coming through as well. And uh, great to hear myself used in one of your examples, by the way. Oh, I had to pick on someone, <laughs> Thank right? <you. laughs> Thanks again. Um, yes, this uh, the session has been recorded and we will share that. Um, but if you do have further questions, please keep them coming. Reach out to us, reach out to Carl. Um, just a reminder that we do have another session in the IMG webinar series coming up on the 22nd. Uh, so please join us for that. Um, that's all around uh, secured signing, um, uh, presenting how they integrate with, with Content Manager. But in the meantime, we do have the RIMPA convention and event next week. So um, if you're attending, please come by and say hello to us on the MicroFocus stand, but of course to Wildlinks as well. Um, they'll, they'll be there too. Uh, so we look forward to um, celebrating at a few of the drinks and events and, um, and I look forward to seeing you there if, uh, if you're able to join us. Um, and, on that, I'll have... say thank you, Carl, and thanks everyone for joining us today. Not a pleasure. Thanks, guys. See you next, see you next time.